So I um, am one of the few people that just moved to Minnesota last week. And how did Minnesota thank me? I caught a cold. So <laughs> apologies <laughs> if my voice fails. Um, OK, so I am hardcore scientist. Uh, 17 years in science, first started in microbiology. That's where I cut my teeth at Berkeley, um, studying the cool things that bacteria do and how they live and how they can survive stress and antibiotics and toxin exposure and how they work together to really maximize their potential and how they survive. And then I completely switched gears and I went to Stanford and I studied the human side of the problem of chronic inflammatory diseases. Uh, personally, um, I have a family member who was touched by autoimmune disease and so that's why I decided to go into more of the interrelationship between what happens when the human immune response cannot stop and shut itself off because it can, it, it, it's overacting against the microbes that live on us and in us. And while I was at Stanford, it was really interesting and unfortunate, but my grandmother, who I was actually, who has rheumatoid arthritis, she was, I saw her basically fail. Um, I failed her as a granddaughter. I didn't recognize that she could no longer take care of her own mouth. And the assisted living facility was not taking care of her mouth either. So the system failed her as well. And I kind of really got upset and at myself and at the system. And I'm rolling up my sleeves and trying to make the, I don't know, system a little bit better but I'm an outsider looking in, so I'm not a dentist or a hygienist. Um, I'm just trying to do what I can with what I know. So I went back to my roots and went focused in the mouth. So the mouth is a super cool place for microbiologists to play. It's home to the second most diverse microbiome in the body, aside from the lower GI tract. Your mouth houses hundreds of viruses, fungi, and over 700 species of bacteria. We're talking huge biodiversity. And, you know, I don't know if you've read a lot in the news, but you've heard this term microbiome. And it really is this whole composition of the microbes that live on you and in you, and they make you who you are. So we really are a super organism walking around. It's really the fact that they outnumber us from not just the genetic potential, but also number of cells. So the microbial cells to human cells outnumber us. So they're really significantly impacting our health and our disease states. And what I think, unfortunately, you know, medicine, we're so focused on the bad bugs and the pathogens that cause all these diseases that we don't really recognize the importance of the good guys and so I'm here as an outsider trying to say, hey, let's rethink about how we approach oral care. Because we, we know from lower GI studies that the more increased biodiversity in the mouth and in the lower GI tract correlates with healthier outcomes. We also know that the more biodiversity you have, and, the, and of that, the lower percentage of pathogens, the healthier you are. And we also know that if you have a lot of good guys that outnumber the bad guys, your outcomes are going to be better as well. And so let's talk a little bit about one of the examples of the good guys, because they often get ignored. So lactic acid bacteria, you guys have probably heard of bifido or lacto. They're often added to like cultures of yogurt, make you better, healthier. Well, the things that they are actually doing, which no one really talks about, or they're helping to control the population. So they're like limiting the pathogens from being able to like overpopulate the mouth. And they're also able to regulate the immune response, which is really important because they're secreting products that basically talk to your immune system and downregulate the, the immune system's activity and balance it out a little bit. And then also importantly is they protect and maintain healthy barriers in your mouth. So, so people with like leaky gut syndrome have a tendency of having more pathogens, having fewer good guys. Same thing happens in your mouth. With bleeding gums, you tend to have more pathogens, less lactic acid bacteria. 
So I call these guys the Yoda, if you guys are <laughs> geeks like me. Um, and these guys, you guys know them as, as the red complex, which I just learned there was a red complex. I know them as Porphyromonas gingivalis, Treponema uh, denticola, and Tanarella forsythia. These guys are awesome from a microbiologist's perspective. Probably dentists don't like them. <laughs> um, they're kind of a triumvirate. You can't get Tanarella to survive without Porphyromonas inhabiting the gums. All these guys love gum tissue. That's where they grow. Um, they're usually colonizers later stage in a biofilm. So a biofilm is like a community of bacteria that attach themselves to different surfaces, right? And these guys live in people's gums. They live in, so you can find um, Porphyromonas in pretty much any primate's gums. Uh, but the other two on the, the middle and the, and the right tend to be more human specific. And the problem is, is if, if you get all three of those together, they can cause some really bad things to happen. And what happens is that they have their own arsenal, so they secrete things, which really upsets your immune response. And your immune response also recognizes the surface proteins and will start to really attack the bacteria, but you get bystander effects because your immune system also starts to attack the tissue. And that's why patients get gum inflammation. What scares me as a microbiologist is when you get bleeding gums, these bacteria gain access to the, to the rest of the body. And that's why you see a bunch of links in, in medical literature about the relationship between those organisms and systemic diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, um, aspiration pneumonia, COPD, gastric lesions, uh, precancerous lesions in, in stomach cancer, atherosclerosis, stroke, cardiovascular disease, bacterial endocarditis, pancreatic cancer, just to name a few. There's many, many more links. So the problem is, is that the current modalities that go after trying to limit um, these organisms really don't take into consideration the, the problem or the dynamics that goes on in, in all of our mouths every day. You guys, who brushed their teeth this morning? Good start, okay. So you brush your teeth, right? By the time you walk to your front door to leave your house, they've recolonized your, your mouth, okay? You have not changed their behavior. You haven't done anything. It's setting up the same problem over and over every day. And so the best we can do is, is just to, to decrease the burden, to dislodge them. They keep on coming back because they're in the foods we eat. They will always come back. And so we do things like root scaling and planing, or scaling and root planing, sorry, I'm just learning this stuff. Uh, things that terrify me as a, as a microbiologist, you throw antibiotics at the problem, right, which causes multi-drug resistance and all sorts of other problems, but it's just a temporary fix, right? And you have the carpet bomb effects, like when you use antiseptics, but you're getting rid of the good guys too. So that's not gonna good. And then you have new techniques like lasers and ozone and all this stuff. Problem is, is the bacteria keep on coming back. You haven't changed their behavior. You haven't changed that biofilm. And so what, what we're attempting to do is, is go after the root cause. And we know they're gonna colonize. We know they're gonna come back right after we brush our teeth. We know we have to eat to survive. They're gonna eat first. Um, we know that, that the initial colonizers in plaque are lactic acid bacteria, streptococcus, like all the good guys, they love sugar. They're, they're taking the sugar you eat, they eat it first, and then their byproducts are acid, which causes more inflammation, can erode um, enamel, and they're making the food sources for the, the later stage biofilm inhabitants, your red complex people. And so it's the, f it's the byproducts that are feeding P. gingivalis and setting up P. gingivalis in that biofilm in the gums. And then you're getting this dependency because the waste products that P. gingivalis is making happens to feed and enable treponema and tanarella to then reside. And so you're, that's the interdependency and this interlinking that's going on. And so where we're focused is very, very upfront of the chain 
Okay, so we're really trying to change the ecology in, these, in everyone's mouth. And we're doing that by blocking their ability globally, all the bacteria, even the good guys, of using dietary sugars. And we're asking the good guys to instead please use dietary protein, because I know if I switch up the, the food source, I'm going to change the byproducts that they're secreting, which is going to have ramifications downstream. And so by getting rid of the food sources for beet gingivalis, you're therefore going to knock out all the bad guys. Okay, and you're also going to get rid of some acid, which is a good thing. And so if we were indeed going to do this, uh, so we did basically three years worth of in vitro studies, which I'm not going to take you through because that's really boring for you guys, but <clears throat> basically we, we showed that we could do this. We could just take normal dietary ingredients and feed them to the bacteria in the biofilms that we isolated from different people's mouths, and we stopped them and we, we challenged them with so much sugar, and the bacteria couldn't eat it. They didn't make acid, they didn't make additional plaque, pathogens didn't grow. Lactobacillus was still able to hang out, but it, didn't cause, it wouldn't cause gum erosion. And then we put the ingredients in a little like lozenge, like a breath mint, so people, thinking people, oh, people will use this then, right? <laughs> There's a compliance issue that, which we're discovering, which you guys know, obviously know a lot about, but, um, but the thing is, is that the question was like, okay, so if, if, we, if we build these into an, a mint, something that everyone knows how to use, and they take it, can we see an immediate effect on blocking acid production in the mouths of people? So we did that study, it was a one hour study, and we gave 25 people, we had them eat, um, we measured their pH of their saliva, you can see they're like five and a half all the way to 6.8, and pH is a log scale, so that's a pretty big range. Um, and that was their baseline, and we gave them the lozenge, took them about two minutes to suck it until it was gone, and then we challenged them with a, a, a suckers, and you can see that over the course of the next hour, the bacteria were not able to really make acid, which is really cool. So we stopped the bacteria in these people's mouths from, from, from using that primary nutrient source, which they prefer. Okay, so if, if we did this, then what about... Okay, so we know we blocked the bacteria from making or taking up sugar and making acid. The question is, is will it also, did we also distort or disturb um, and alter the byproducts that were feeding these red complex bad, bad guys? And so we did another study with 22 people, and we took their baseline counts of the lactic acid bacteria, strep mutants, and your bread complex dudes. And then we gave them on a, started on a course of five days, three, three times a day, once after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, these lozenges. And we measured at day five their endpoint counts. And you can see the cool thing is that the, the lactic acid bacteria were still around in these people's mouths, but the strep mutants significantly dropped. And the most important from a, um, a gum disease perspective is that the red complex guys completely dropped too. And that's just in five days. Pretty cool stuff, really excited. What we're learning though is, you know, this is not a drug, these are just dietary ingredients. So this is where medicine <laughs> is used to dealing with drugs or medical devices and they don't know how to think about dietary ingredients as a therapeutic. And we're wondering how to navigate in, in the world of dentistry, which I'm obviously an outsider. So, you know, we've got, we've got ourselves a new paradigm in how we can think about tackling these biofilm-related problems that, have, um, that, are, that are at the interface of uh, the superorganism. And, and it's a preventative approach. And so we're working also in a system that's built for treating things, not preventing things. So we're trying to figure out how to navigate in today's world. So I'm just planting that seed. If you have ideas, please come and chat with me later.
but I don't want to take up too much of your time. But I do want to thank um, Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging. They're our partner, and, and for a grant, we're doing a double-blinded placebo-controlled study to look at um, our approach with uh, gingivitis in older adults. And it's funded by the NIH, and then we're also collaborating with <clears throat> a diagnostic lab, and we're building out um, a panel to assess what good guys look like in different age ranges, and so we can figure out how we can start to build in biofeedback mechanisms so people can monitor their own flora. So, yeah, because I don't know who lives in your mouth, so I don't know how to, like, dose you. Yeah, and that's our problem. <laughs> so, so basically, yeah, so I'll leave it with that. If anyone has questions, you can answer now or ask them now or, or later. Hit me up later. I'm here for the rest of the day.